Welcome to this presentation on altruism and the intervention process. Altruism is a topic that social psychologists have been interested in for a long time. And altruistic behavior is behavior that benefits someone else, but does not appear to offer any clear benefit for the person doing the behavior. And in fact, the behavior usually costs the altruist something in terms of time or resources or risk. Now, some cynical social psychologists would propose that there really is no such thing as true altruism and that the helper is always getting something out of it in the long run. I'm not going to take sides on that issue one way or the other, but I will say that there clearly appear to be behaviors that we think of as altruistic. And in this part of the course, we want to talk a little bit about what the things are that uh, determine when we're going to help others and when we don't. And I'm going to emphasize helping in emergency situations. Social psychologists have studied altruism in all kinds of situations, including non-emergency situations. So, for example, if somebody asks for help carrying something up a flight of stairs, or if somebody drops an envelope that obviously was meant to be mailed, uh, does a stranger pick it up and take the trouble to go and mail it for them? Those are interesting, and we've learned a lot by doing research on that. But for now, I'm going to focus on emergency situations. And here's what I mean by an emergency situation. First of all, we're talking about a situation where somebody has actually been hurt or there's the threat of somebody experiencing real physical harm. So uh, either harm has happened or there's the potential for harm happening. Secondly, emergencies are unusual and rare. Now, sometimes when I say this in class, a student will say, well, wait a minute, you can pick up the local newspaper and see all kinds of emergencies that happened right here in town just last night. And yes, that's true. But what I'm saying is that in the life of most individuals, I hope, emergencies are relatively unusual and rare. Uh, unless you have a job in an emergency room or you're a police officer or someone whose job it is, to deal with emergencies. Hopefully most of you don't have emergencies very often. And finally, emergencies are unforeseen. That's where the word comes from. They emerge. It's not like you wake up in the morning and check your calendar and say, well, I'm going to have an emergency at 11 o'clock today. I better get ready. No, you're just living your life, going about whatever it is you're doing, and boom, suddenly this emergency confronts you. So the kind of helping behavior we're going to talk about today involves all of those characteristics. So if a person confronts an emergency, there's a series of decisions the person has to go through before they will actually help. And this series of decisions is known as the intervention process. And if a person gets frozen at any one of these stages, they won't actually intervene and provide help for the person who needs it. Now, some of these are going to sound fairly commonsensical, and they are, but nevertheless, they are cognitive steps that the person has to take before he or she will supply help. The first thing is that you have to notice that something is happening. If you don't notice that something has happened, you're certainly not going to intervene. And this is not always as easy as it might sound. So if you're walking down a very busy city street and you're glancing at your phone and there's people crowded all around you, you may not notice the body of somebody slumped over in a doorway uh, just a few feet from where you're walking. Or you may not notice uh, some other event happening in your surroundings simply because you're not paying attention. So if you don't notice that something is happening, you certainly aren't going to help. So step one, you have to notice. Secondly, if you do notice that something is happening, you have to interpret the event as an emergency. And this isn't always easy either. Imagine, imagine yourself walking across the, the Knox campus after a class one day, and you're passing by some shrubbery around one of the dormitories, and you notice somebody's leg sticking out from under the bushes. Well, what do you do? I mean, a lot of weird stuff happens around here, right? So maybe that's an emergency, maybe somebody needs help, or maybe it's somebody just kind of fooling around, or maybe it's a ground worker uh, who's under there doing some kind of work. Uh, 
if you don't decide that the event is an emergency, you're not going to uh, do anything. So your interpretation of the event is going to be very, very important. So let's suppose you decide that uh, the thing you've noticed is in fact an emergency. The next stage is that you have to decide that you have some personal responsibility to act. You have to decide that it's up to you to do something. And if you don't do that, even though you think you're witnessing an emergency, you're not going to be very helpful. And even if you decide that you do have some personal responsibility, the next step is that you have to figure out what it is you can do. And after that, you have to actually carry through with the intervention. When you talk to people who have not intervened in an emergency situation, you'll notice that they get frozen at all kinds of different stages of the process and giving them any information that will help resolve ambiguity or clarify the situation will make them more helpful. Let me give you an example of just one experiment that, that shows how resolving the indecision at any one of these stages uh, will make people more helpful. This was a study that was done quite a long time ago, and the subjects in the study were people that were at a public beach. Well, uh, the subjects in the study were just kind of at the beach, laying there on their blanket, enjoying the nice day, when a person came along who um, appeared to be just another normal person who was gonna be using the beach, and this individual spread out a blanket and had some personal belongings, including a great big boom box back in the day when people had these uh, large boom boxes for playing music. The newcomer spread out the stuff and then turned to the person who was already there and engaged in a very brief conversation. In one condition, he made a simple request like, do you know what time it is? Or do you have a match? In the other condition, the person said, uh, excuse me, I've got to go back up to the other side of the beach for a few minutes. Would you please watch my stuff? So half of the subjects were not given any responsibility of any sort. The other half were explicitly given instructions to be responsible for the belongings of the person who had just showed up. Shortly after this, a young man came strolling along uh, making sure that the uh, subject in the experiment could see him and know what he was doing. And he grabbed the person's boombox who had just left and started running down the beach. And what the researchers were interested in is would the person who was observing do anything to help? And would the request that the, sub or that the Confederate had made uh, have any impact? Now, the researchers were very flexible about what counted as helping. If the person just sat up and said, hey, what are you doing? Bring that back. That would have counted. Uh, if the individual got up and looked for a lifeguard or a policeman, that would have counted. Some of the people in the experiment actually chased the young man down the beach and tackled him to get the boombox back. And that's pretty extreme, but it certainly counted as helping behavior. I always wondered who the, the poor guy was who got talked into doing this as his part in the experiment. Anyway, the interesting thing about the results were that when the person who had spread his stuff out on the beach uh, engaged in simple conversation and then walked away, only 20% of the time did people try to be helpful. That meant 80% of them sat there and watched the guy's radio get stolen and didn't do anything about it at all. In the other condition, however, 95% of the people tried to do something to help. So just resolving the ambiguity about whether they had personal responsibility or not made people extremely more helpful. I once saw a reenactment by a TV news team uh, that I wish I could find again to show you, but I haven't been able to find it. But um, to find out about the intervention process, they actually um, tied up a young woman and gagged her and put her on a park bench in the middle of a busy city in the middle of the day. Now, the woman was obviously a member of the news team and not just some random person they did this to. Anyway, uh, she was sitting on a park bench, tied up and gagged, uh, right next to a busy sidewalk where people were passing through the park. And the journalists were interested in seeing who would stop and who wouldn't. And they were waiting down at the end of the sidewalk so that if somebody walked by and had not helped the young woman, 
they would interview them and ask them, well, what were you thinking? And they found for the people who didn't help that they were frozen at all of these different steps of the intervention process. Some of them literally hadn't known that anything was happened. When the journalist would point back, they would look at it and act shock and say, oh my God, I didn't even notice her. I was busy daydreaming or talking to my friend or whatever. At the next stage, other people were frozen. Uh, people said, yeah, I saw that, but I didn't know what was going on, but it looked fishy to me. It just didn't look like a real emergency. Other people were frozen at the third stage. They saw the emergency. They were a little worried about it, but they figured it wasn't their responsibility. I mean, there must be a policeman or somebody around whose job it would be to take care of this. Uh, some people were still thinking about it, mulling over, should I call somebody? Should I go for help? Uh, they were still trying to decide what form of assistance to give. And there were some people who actually decided, I should do something about this. I should go look for a police officer. But they just didn't do it. They just didn't carry through. So every step in this process can interfere with an individual's ability. In the next set of PowerPoint slides, we're going to really emphasize one thing that has a very strong effect on individuals' ability to navigate the intervention process and to be helpful. And this is something called the bystander effect. And it's counterintuitive. Um, what the bystander effect really means is that the more people that are standing around when an emergency occurs, the less likely it is that anybody is going to do anything. So for example, if I'm in the front of a classroom uh, lecturing and then class lets out and everybody streams out of the room and there's just one student left and I engage that student in conversation and we're the only two people in the room, if I suddenly fall to the floor clutching my chest, acting like I'm having a medical emergency, no matter who that student is, no matter what my relationship to that person is, I am very confident that individual will do something to try to help me. On the other hand, if uh, this happens, I slump to the floor and clutch my chest in the middle of class when there are 50 students sitting there, there'll be a lot of uncomfortable shifting around and giggling and exchanging of glances. And I will lay there for a lot longer before somebody decides to actually do something. So this is what the bystander effect is all about. And in the next set of PowerPoint slides, we'll explore this in some detail. Ability to provide help.